of the Richmond Board of Education will come to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sandy, you could please read our mission statement and take roll call. At Richmond Community Schools, we provide a quality education that empowers students to be successful in the global community. Board Member Telto? Here. Board Member Cunningham? Here. Board Member Oldani is absent with notice. Board Member Michon? Here. Board Member Bartell? Here. Board Member Sutton? Here. I am Board Member Fortuna. I am here. We have a quorum. We also have our two student representatives here, Elizabeth Schaefer and Joseph Pacito. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Support. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? Mr. Walmsley? Um, as far as the regular meeting minutes and the special meeting minutes, there were no errors that were brought to my attention. Um, the personnel report is attached in, in your board packet. Uh, claims and accounts, I received uh, one set of questions from board member uh, Felto. Um, I did send the, the, the boards you had, but the questions were regarding check number 57147 uh, regarding a soccer banquet uh, and reimbursement costs. Um, when I look at the, what the, the reason for that uh, cost and the timing um, was there what the re reimbursement was submitted in July for a June 26th banquet. Um, it did not include the receipt for the reimbursement. And there was not a budget form that was uh, uh, submitted at the time on file, so we don't reimburse without a budget form. But once all that was received, um, then we did issue the check. Um, the coach had paid the cost front um, and then we reimburse the coach for that cost but it, that, that's the delay on that the second was regarding check number 57 145 and 57 125 which went to another coach for reimbursement the reimbursement um, uh, these reimbursements were issued in September from last year um, they were for items that were part of a um, uh, expenses for last year's. Um, those expenses are being that are allowable to be reclassified towards the general fund athletic supplies rather than the internal account. Um, the question came up is can we still do that at this point? And the answer is yes. Um, at some point the auditors say no more journal entries and then anything going forward have to be come on out of this year's budget. If it, even if it was from last year. Um, I don't have an answer regarding the basic supplies that should have run through the athletic director um, and not just run through the internal account because as the board has done in the last couple of years, you've put supply money in that. Um, so I, I, I will have to follow up on that question um, or that comment in terms of why the coach elected to spend uh, almost $3,000 out of their own personal money rather than using the system uh, that we have in place here. So you're gonna you're gonna answer those those were my additional questions so everybody knows um, from the email though. So you're gonna get those. Yeah, so those like emails. for instance if, if there's a check that needs to be to a banquet, we do this multiple times, especially with field trips. I think mean, GSRP just signed on them this week to go to the farm or the cider mill. So they tell us the date they need to check by, we get a process and then they take the check to the event. That would be no different than a banquet. If the money's in the account and they need the check to pay the night of the banquet, we can issue the check. Um, I, I don't know the timing in terms of you know, last minute and so forth. Generally, we're able to accommodate, but there are some cases that we won't be able to. So I will follow up with um, Preston, with Jamie here, and he and I will uh, talk about why the coach spent that much money uh, for supplies that should not when you look at that list, most of that is a basic supply, volleyball, scoreboard, scorebooks, and so forth that should have been paid out of the district's athletic 
supply count. Because my, my, my thing initially was, I don't want anybody spending that kind of money um, out of their own pocket. But then the question, my additional question that I had was after I read the memo was, what if the purchases were approved? You went and spent this money and maybe we already had this, so something like that. So somehow we got to figure something out and you said you're going to get back and let us know how Yeah, that but we will follow up on that with, with um, Preston and uh, we'll either get back to the board or I'll bring it to the next meeting either way. Um, but that's the exact right. It, it, just to kind of for those relatively new on the board, when I first got here, all of these came to the board. And when we change that practice, that if you have a budget on file that shows what your what your income is and what you're spending the money on, then we are authorized to approve it. And we have um, countlessly tried to remind people every year get that budget. You can amend it at any time, so just get your starting budget in, and so that we can process checks with income. Questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda is our 2023-24 student data presentation. Good evening. Hey, Heidi. Got, got one job, Heidi. <laughs> Switch us over. <laughs> 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 All right, so lots of great things to celebrate in our data presentation this evening. I'm going to let the principals do most of the, the fun stuff and they'll highlight all of the big pieces. But um, before we get to their building wide presentations, I will give a little overview of the testing this year, uh, which is also uh, can hit a, a preview of next week's community conversation, which will be all about testing as well. I think you have the invitation for that uh, in your uh, papers. Um, so just that general overview as a reminder, um, kind of what students are being tested on and then what the purpose of the state assessments are, since that's what we'll look at today, um, and then the benchmarks, benchmark assessments uh, for us and WEA. So as a reminder, the, all students in grades three through seven are tested ELA and math with the MSTEP test at this time. And then once they get eighth grade, it switches over to PSAT or SAT. Um, and so again, that continues with the LA and math every year through 11th grade. Um, and then they highlight social studies and science at different times throughout that period. So in uh, 5, 8, and 11, they do social studies and science as well. So quite a bit um, you know, with the testing for the students to, to get through uh, that each spring. Um, but then I really like this highlight that um, I saw in one of the overviews um, for assessment. Just that reminder, right? This is not like the end all be all. It is a snapshot of a moment in time for their testing. And we can really use this information to make a lot of decisions. But it doesn't really necessarily get down to that student level, like really, you know, what each student is truly knowing um, as an individual. And we, you know, we do that work in the district. So this, there, was a little delay. Um, so the next couple of slides are just examples of what the students see. So probably I know for myself when I took it was me at the time, right? And then I think it was still ACT before they switched over to SAT. Everything was paper and pencil, right? Bubbling, um, just very, very traditional. And so that is not the case anymore. Uh, we're pretty much fully digital at this point with all of the assessments. And so I think for a lot of us that went through school and that was what we were used to, we, we talk about these assessment results, but we don't even necessarily know what the students are actually experiencing during those assessment windows. Um, so I thought it might be nice to share that tonight. And like I said, this is just a small preview. We'll go a little bit deeper next week um, <clears throat> at the uh, community conversation. Um, so this is, is an example, and I'm sorry, it's not the most clear. I think you do have a copy of it, though, in front of you, um, of a third grade question in ELA. So some things that I would point out is there's, you know, there's multiple screens. They have tools that they would need to be able to access on top of just being able to show that they had the knowledge of that ELA standard that this question might be asking about. Um, that, that panel on the left, they would potentially need to scroll down to get to further pieces of the text while the question might remain over here. And um, just in looking at it, it, to me, it doesn't look like the whole question is there. I think they would need to expand that window. Um, and so this was, you know, again, just a sample question from their site. But pretty, pretty difficult as far as all the things that need to go into it on top of just showing their ELA knowledge. 
This one's a little bit more traditional style. This is a math question from the sixth grade M stuff. Um, so again, they're asking them to identify those, those fractions on the number line, and they would select a multiple choice. Again, something that we're more familiar with traditionally, but just interesting, this could be mixed in with those higher level questions. You never know what the next click is going to get you. Um, this one is an example of an eighth grade social studies question. So they are pictures that they're asking the students to look at and analyze. Again, they would need to select them to enlarge them so they can see them clearly and then make a decision about what those pictures were representing. And then lastly, and this one, again, I feel like is the most complicated, as you might imagine, it is 11th grade, but an 11th grade science question. Um, so, you know, there's a graphic display, again, double panels going on, different information in different places on the screen. Um, the style of answer is they have two different places to click down and select their answer. So, again, just really highlighting as we think about this and, you know, as we see the trends in the scores, so much has changed from, from really not that long ago. Um, so our students are really uh, experiencing a lot, and our teacher is trying to keep up with teaching, you know, in a new way as well. So as far as our um, comparison scores, so these next few slides will show Richmond scores compared to Macomb County and then compared to the state. And this particular graph is our ELA percent of students that were, were advanced or proficient. So that's what the state would look at as considering um, proficient students that would not be considered at risk. Um, so we are the green bar to the right on each chart, and the county is orange and the state is blue. So across the board uh, through sixth grade, we're well above or you know, at least real close to the state and county average, so beating them out. And then we do see that dip in seventh grade. Um, we have some, you know, we've had some conversations, and Ms. Morella will talk a little bit more about you know, already what, what steps are being taken to look at that and address that and keep that. Um, information very relevant. And this one takes you, it just looks at that trend, so each line is a different grade level, so that kind of bright green at the top is the eighth grade, um, seventh grade is the purple, um, and so on. So it has, again, each of those grade levels showing sort of what they're looking like from 2021 through 2024. Again, this is just um, each year what the fourth graders did or each year what the third graders did. This particular graph doesn't necessarily show like one cohort grow, growing, but we do see, I'll highlight uh, in a few minutes, some overall cohort growth as well. Uh, very similar story in math, um, also well above the state and county averages in math. So again, keeping in mind where the green bar, um, but again, that same little dip that we see in seventh grade. performing up there. So again, that being the only the, the grade that's testing at least. And science, so again, this is a fewer, smaller group of students. So this is that eighth, uh, excuse me, fifth, eighth, and eleventh grade. Um, so fifth grade, and fifth grade would be, well, they all of these are on stuff, I take the back. So uh, science is always on the stuff um, across the grade levels. So um, similar and again even though our you know our green bar is a little lower on 11th you can see it does kind of tend to trend down um, as they switch from SAT um, towards those higher level SAT style questions and greater level there's a little missing link for eighth grade um, they were chain transitioning the science test so there were uh, a couple years where they did not have trend data to, to share they didn't put that out together um, so we don't have those uh, available, but we do see, I mean, you can see at 2021, there's a little orange dot all the way to the side, so pretty solid growth, even without that little chunk missing in the middle, and overall trending up uh, very nicely with science for all three grade levels. And for social studies, and similar, if not beating the, the state really close right there, um, they did, the state did uh, re- revamp the social studies test in the last year so it aligns much more closely with the state standards which is nice so um, we feel a lot more confident that what we are teaching in the classroom and expected to teach is actually what they're being tested on so let's just have that confidence of okay this is you know this is a true picture of really where the students are so this one is very um, a good sign a good telling sign anything else 
and we see some these trends in the right direction, especially in the last couple of years with social studies. And then we move into the PSAT or SAT area. Um, again, you'll see a couple of missing bars there for the county because the state does not look at the ninth and 10th grade as far as um, state accountability. Um, those with the county just didn't, didn't average that out for us in the um, data that I was pulling because again, they don't, they don't use it for index scores. So um, they do in eighth grade and 11th grade though. So we see all three there um, and again, seeing our scores either above or very, very close to that state average and well above any kind of address considerations. And yeah, it's very similar. And there's that trend line for this is just SAT, so our 11th graders over the course of the last four years. So a couple of things before I let the principals brag about their buildings and their great students. Um, overall, if you, you know, were to look back at those graphs, you would um, see that we are higher than the county and state on all of the assessments third through sixth grade. So that was all, all content areas third through sixth. We did beat the county and state averages. Um, I didn't include the MyAxis graphs here. It's a much smaller group of students and they're pretty, they're big graphs with a lot of things going on on one graph, um, but all of our students who took the My Access did surpass or attain their benchmark goals, so definitely great there with our um, special education students that take the My Access test. And then even for some of those areas where we might not have beat the state or county um, marks, we did see 10% growth on six separate assessments for that four-year trend. So when we looked at those line graphs, um, again, some of those gains were quite large at 10% or more six tests. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to, let's see, oh. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I love talking about data, um, not only with you guys, but also the teachers. Um, and tomorrow, I'm excited, is our first common planning meeting, or second common planning meeting of the year, and we're going to spend it talking about all things data. So um, what you can see up here is our SAT English 11 um, language arts. So these are all the 11th graders. Um, the pie chart on your left-hand side um, is looking at the way, um, one of the ways that they calculate the data is meets or exceeds the benchmark, which is our green students, the orange, which is approaching the benchmark, and then the blue, which is not yet at the benchmark. And so looking at this, one of the promising pieces that I like to look at is always that approaching students. Um, what students are we are almost there that we just kind of need to get over that hump. And with that being said, when I was looking back at some of the data from past years, that green area has gotten larger and that orange area has gotten smaller. And so we're able to show that we're getting more of those students into that meets or exceeds benchmark area, which is uh, one of the goals. In the trend data, um, obviously this goes back all the way 10 years. Um, that's how the state pr uh, presents it to us. And I think that while it is downward trending, I think that everyone's, well, what's going on? Um, we know that we've gotten a lot of new staff over the years. And so one of the things that they've really been focusing on is not only getting to know the curriculum, but also getting to know the extent of the resources. And so with the implementation of Savis, I always call it Savis, but the teacher is Savis, um, that Savis resources that are being implemented, um, really looking at that with fidelity. And what I mean by that is that we're not just using bits and pieces. This is research-based curriculum programming, and so we need to make sure that we're doing all aspects of it. And that also lends itself to our English 9 and English 10 support classes, which are new this year. And so what those support classes look like is that we were able to take students based on their NWEA scores, as well as their PSAT data, which usually goes hand in hand, we were able to take that and identify students that we felt could use some additional support at the ninth and 10th grade levels. There was a small group of students that self-selected to be in that class, which we thought is great. Um, but what the teachers are able to do with the new curriculum resources is the class activities or experiences, because there are so many, 
If they're able to then, in those support classes, embed those other activities and resources in. So the students in the support classes are getting, let's just say, hypothetically, all 10 activities that might go along with Unit 1, whereas not all 10 activities might be embedded in the regular classroom setting. Um, and so that just helps with the support. And so not only that, but looking at their lesson plans, meeting with them, doing the common planning, as well as embedding that district-provided PD for the Sabbath training um, is really how they're focusing on making sure that it's implemented with fidelity. Um, in terms of NWEA, you totally cannot see the blue bars if you're looking up at the main screen, if you're looking at the ones behind us. Um, the NWEA, just a little bit about this, um, the orange triangle, that is what the projected growth of each grade was. The blue bars you're seeing show what the observed growth is. And the one thing I want to make note of is that when we did look at this graph halfway through the year, Every one of the tests, so grade 9 through 12 for both reading and language use, was all above the orange uh, diamonds, triangles, whatever the shape is. Um, and so when the teachers saw this at the end of the year, they were really, you know, hard on themselves. But they said, we had so much growth in the middle of the year, what can be explained for this? And one thing I will say is that in April and May of a high school, especially with our seniors, but then also with our 11th graders with NWEA, three more tests being taken after the English, the math, the SAT, the essay writing, the M-STEP, all of those things, AP testing, sometimes the kids are just tired. And so I truly believe that these graphs are indicative of that because when we look at the data from February when they took the test, um, we did see that the observed growth was high in all of those areas. So I just wanted to make note of that um, because like I said, the teachers are really hard on themselves, but uh, they really did a great job looking at their data this year. Um, one of the things that the departments chose to do this year is look at a department SMART goal. And so for the English department, they're looking at increasing the average scores of their summative performance assessments associated with the end of each unit. And so this goes back to using the new curriculum resources with Fidelity. At the end of each unit, they are going to be looking at that average of the performance assessments. And one of the things that I like about the performance assessments is that that's the applying their knowledge. It's not just a 30 question multiple choice test that they're going to give the kids and then give them a score. It really is having students perform the tasks and the skills that they learned. And so as a, as a department, they all said, we're going to bring to the table these averages associated with an, each end of unit assessment with the hope that as the year has gone on, those scores continue to get uh, higher and higher. So that is reading, or English language arts. Looking at our math, um, again, the same type of graph here. We've got our blue, which is showing the meets and exceeds benchmark, the orange, which is the approaching, and the green, not yet approaching. Obviously, we can see right now that the green is the largest part of the pie chart, but I'm really excited if you look at the actual trend data from 2021, uh, when we were at approximately about 12%. Um, we now are over 20 and I think like 22. So we've seen over 10% increase just in the last two years. And so again, the same thing with the SAMUS curriculum, making sure that that's being implemented with fidelity. Um, this is the second year of our support classes and I am excited to say that the enrollment in all three of them for Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 has all increased. Again, more students are self-selecting to be in that class, but then also um, we were able to look at NWEA scores and state assessment data to also put some additional students in there that could use some support. Um, same, same idea, the extra resources that come with the curriculum being implemented in there, as well as some additional guidance use of Desmos and some of the other mathematic tools, which we can see from the examples of this state testing, are so important to be able to know how to use a maneuver um, to ensure that you're really um, giving yourself the best bet. For the department SMART goal, what they chose to focus on is the heart of eligible content. And so what that means is there's a bunch of different categories that the SAT and PSAT looks at. And when they look at the three-year data, PSAT 9, PSAT 10, and then the M, 
NMSQT testing, they see that the heart of algebra is the one area where we are scoring the lowest. And so what they've actually implemented is all the teachers are giving their classes three questions each week for 12 weeks. And what they're doing with those questions is they're going through the heart of algebra as their warm up, whether it's a ninth grader or an 11th grader, and even the 12th graders are doing this as well if they have math. And so what they're doing is they're presenting these questions as a department they went through and they chose questions that they felt were appropriate based on what the data showed. And so they're hoping to see that as time goes on between now and test time come early April, um, that that heart of algebra, those averages will increase. And so again, using the data and then identifying an area that they think needs to be strengthened and then focusing in on that. The NWEA scores, again, for those of you that can see the blue bars, all three or all four grade levels, 9, 10, 11, and 12, all showed greater growth than what was projected. And I really, truly believe if you look at the percentage of the students who met their growth, three of the four were over 60%. And even our 12th graders who, again, are taking this test three or four days before their last day of high school, 56% of those students met their math growth. And so I truly believe that this is directly tied to that correlation of the Sabbath curriculum resources. And I'm hopeful that we will see the same results with the English um, moving forward as well. But this is just great growth and I think also um, gives that confidence to our teachers that what they're doing in the classroom, even though it might be hard and uncomfortable, um, it, is, it is showing results. For our social studies, um, again, if you look at the trend over the last three years, um, over 10% increase um, and just a 9.1 increase, 9.1 percentage point increase from just last year. And I truly believe um, that the department has really focused on um, not just doing things the same way that they used to, looking at how they can create new rubrics, how they can you know, shape things up and get students more involved in the social studies, uh, government, and economic process. And with that being said, as uh, was mentioned earlier, they're actually getting really good results and really good feedback in regards to the testing. And so with the social studies, they're getting the standard and then also how the students scored. And so when we received those back, they really were able to see what areas need some additional work. And so one of the things that they identified was world history. And so what their thought was is that world history is what students take in ninth grade, and it's not getting that revisit back as juniors. And so they already started planning on kind of doing a little boot camp just to refresh things um, before testing this year. And then also their goal um, that they chose to focus on is the close and critical reading and writing practice using a common rubric. And so what they're doing is, um, this is something that was once done, it sounds like um, some years ago, but they're really looking at all of us using the same rubric and making sure that we're doing a lot of writing and close and critical reading. Because again, as we see from the examples of the testing, it's looking at whether it's pictures or a long passage and then having to figure out how am I gonna answer these questions or how am I going to possibly have to write about something. So. Kudos to the social studies department. I know they were really excited when they saw this, uh, their results, because I think, especially in the past two years, they felt like, oh, when is it gonna start going up? And so again, as you start seeing those positive results, I know that that just uh, gives them the drive to do even more. And the last group we have, science. Um, as you can see, the science score in the past year did take a dip. We have that big chunk of missing time from 2000, the 2016-17 school year to the 21-22 school year. Um, but with this being said, I think this is one of the things that we identified last year is the missing piece of our science, and that was that set of standards that was not necessarily being covered um, in some of those third year science classes. And so this year we re-implemented the earth and physical science class for all of the junior students. Um, we still have a large number of students that are taking um, anatomy and physiology, forensics. We brought AP chemistry back, so we have students that are still electing to take that class. 
We have AP Bio running again, which was brought back last year. So even though we have implemented this course um, for all junior students, I do believe that there's still that passion to take some of these elective classes. And I know that that was something that was maybe worried about of like, oh, our kids gonna still take those, which they are, but also through the Earth Physical Science class, we're ensuring that they meet that last set of standards that is on the M-STEP test. And with this goal, um, the department chose to focus on CERs, which are claims, evidence, and reasoning. So again, looking at their writing and then a rubric score that comes from that. And so as a department, they're looking at incorporating more of the writing into their everyday assignments and also their lab activities in order to help with just the reading and then being able to make claims about something and then justify the reasoning, which will um, not only help with the standardized testing, but also essay writing and other things in the future. And my last little piece of data, just kind of looking at our cohorts, um, class of 2025. Um, so starting in ninth grade, what their mean was, going from the 861 to 892, and then 911 uh, last year. Our class of 2026, which is the current juniors, uh, they were at an 856, went to an 857, so only one point mean increase, but it was an increase. And tomorrow they are taking the PSAT at MSQT, and so we will have that next set of data that we'll be able to use between now and April when they take the real um, SAT uh, to use to guide that. So. Um, Lots of uh, work has been done, and I think just uh, credit to the teachers for all the work that they have done the past two years, um, and just their willingness to continue to move forward with uh, looking at data and creating instruction based off of it. Question. Any questions from the table? Do we have the ability to change around when we do the testing, so they're not so on top of each other? So we were, we've talked a little bit about that. So this, as far as the state assessments, the, the old answer was like not at all. It was one day and then there was a makeup day. As it shifted as it shifted to digital, there's a little bit of a testing window, but it's still a very tight, you know, I mean, it, you really have to plan for certain days within that window. Um, the place where we have a little bit more flexibility is NWEA, but you have to set a district window, and the elementary needs theirs to be within a certain amount of days from the end of the school year. So that, again, it gives us a really tight spot. So we've started looking at it this year. It was a little too late this year because we just didn't set these in advance. Um, but that is absolutely a conversation that we're having there. There's little pockets of flexibility, and we want to maximize those. So yeah, we are definitely considering that. But there's still a lot of testing going on at every school level. Oh, and, and we can't lose sight. There are three laws, governances. You have the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which says we have to do the sample testing at the federal level, which is why you have the three, eight, nine, so forth. You have the state of Michigan, which does M step every grade level and other things that they put in place. And then we have our local assessment, NWA, which is basically what we use to measure growth, and it's also part of our evaluation system. So you've got three pockets that are kind of governing the assessment. All with the intent of giving data to be able to inform instruction. Meet test, meet test, I keep saying meet test. <laughs> test data, you know, publicly released at the end of August, beginning of September. These kids are gone and moved on to the next grade level. And it's, it's, it's hard to do anything with that data, especially the reports you got now. I know the earlier reports we used to get years ago, it was much more informative. And I think I'm glad that just sparked my memory for the science department. When they were looking at their results, they get three circles. It's like an empty circle, a shaded in circle, and then a full circle. And some very broad categories, not standard specific. And so every one of the circles they got was like the half shaded in one. And it was like, okay, well, what do we do? What do we do with that now? And so that's, I think, too, one of the frustrating parts is wanting to do so much with it, but then you also can only do so much with it with what you're handed. And so I think just continuing to embed that in our common planning meetings, our discussions, um, also the discussions within the classrooms of, you know, why why does NWEA matter? Well, this is how we use it, and it's not just about a score or a number. 
this is what helps drive us to show that you might need some additional support or on the complete opposite end of things we had some kids that we've used NWEA before to say listen you need to move into this honors English track because your scores are your you know couple you know grade levels above your actual grade but never really realizing that until we look at that so I do think it's important to make sure that yes it is just one piece of the puzzle about what a school is. There's so many other pieces that go into it, but um, just using it to the best that we can. So, thank you. The so other thing I, I just wanted to say, it was good to hear about the professional development training too, because I just had that conversation with Brian a few weeks ago, because I know we've implemented so many new curriculum, and so at this point, we should start seeing And there's so many bells and whistles that come along with those programs, like one person couldn't really delve into it themselves. Right. You need that time to say, if this is what you're looking for, use this type of activity. And so even just getting comfortable, the teachers getting comfortable with that is important too, because it, it, it can be almost overwhelming that then it becomes crippling, like I don't even know what to do because there's so much to do. So. And the staff has And the training is, is kind of planned out, so it's a year long of training, so those initial sessions are some of those broader strokes, some of the basics, getting in, feeling comfortable, understanding the, the big pieces, and then it gets much more granular as we get towards the end of the year, so those later fees will be very, getting at those bells and whistles, like Andrea said, you know, it'll, it'll really kind of highlight, because now they'll have that comfort with it, okay, now they're gonna be ready to take those next steps. So it's, it's a learning curve, you know, for the yeah. teachers as well, but um, I think the plan is in place to support them. Thank you. Up next, Ms. Morella from the Middle School. Good evening, everybody. All right. So, um, we, I'm just going to start by saying we do have so much to be proud of um, based on the scores that I'm going to show you. But we also know that we have some work to do as well. Um, we'll start right away um, with the, the ELA on step, and you can't really see it on that one, but you can see it behind me, I think. Um, you know, fourth and fifth grade did show a little bit of a dip um, in advanced proficient and proficient, but our sixth grade and seventh grades showed increase in advanced um, proficient and proficient. And so we're really hoping to see either, as we watch those cohorts move, that we can see how those kids are improving in those cohorts. Um, however, we do have some ideas on how we can address some of those dips in the meantime to make sure that all of our students are getting what they need. Um, if we look at um, social studies, I'm sorry, if you look at um, MSTEP math, all grade levels showed an increase in advanced proficient and proficient from last school year. Um, and so we're really excited about that too. But um, if we go back to the fourth grade, we're going to continue using our research-based adopted um, curriculum supports that we have. SAVIS is, um, we show a lot of improvement with the implementation of SAVIS, which we're hoping we're going to see the same thing with our ELA scores. Um, starting tomorrow, all of our students will have um, access to on-demand, uh, practice on-demand tutoring. Um, so that will be implemented for all of our students for the remainder of the school year again. We're going to really push that this year, um, even more so than we did last year, to try and get as many kids as we can who need the support to use the support. Um, we have um, teachers that are using common testing strategies when they're delivering their content. So not only are they just, not only are they teaching the content and using the curriculum supports to do that, they're also embedding testing and strategies on how to do how to take a test, um, especially with our fourth and fifth graders, because as you know. Um, things get progressively more difficult the older that you get. Um, we have a newly um, added literacy and science class, which is really going to help actually in all of our ELA areas as well. So that's why I included it in the ELA part because it's one more literacy class that we have for our sixth graders that can really help um, promote even more growth. And then as Billy has already mentioned that this Social studies test is finally aligned with the Michigan standards. Um, that's always been a bone of contention with me as a fifth grade teacher trying to um, show what the amazing things that my kids knew and weren't able to show because the test wasn't aligned to the standards that we were teaching and now it is. So hopefully we're gonna continue to see some growth um, in that area. 
Um, Before you move yes. on, two things. When you're looking at this chart on here, board members, um, the blue and the orange really should be like a stack bar. Yes. Because that's demonstrating the proficiency. It's advanced and proficient. So when you put them on top of each other, they're exceeding the other one. So that's, that's just a visual. Um, but we get it broken down by this way, so we want to identify it and share with them. The piece that uh, Ms. Morello spoke about, about the science literacy, if you recall in the sixth grade, all sixth graders used to have a wheel they go to. There was four classes previously, so we would take the entire population of the sixth grade and divide them into four classes. There might have been five sections of classes, but we put them into um, four. So your number one, your class size goes up when you do that. Oh, yeah. This year, um, Mrs. Clore, is, who's also a science certified, she's a choir teacher at the um, middle school, we added the science literacy class so we can keep those class sizes smaller and address the literacy, especially in the content area. So they will go through basically eight, five, eight weeks blocks, much like we do with the elementary specials model. Um, just to give you the context, because you might not remember that, that conversation when we did the budget and the staff and all that. So in that eight weeks, they're getting a different content? They're area? getting, yes. Yes. They get, sort of. Yeah, they did. Um, now they have science literacy. They have um, algebraic thinking. And they have, and Mr. Berger's going to have to help me because I don't remember them off the top of my head. Um, they have. Um, Was it informational text? Informational text, text which something? is more social studies based. That's by, um, taught by Ms. Churchill. Then we have the science and literacy. We have algebraic thinking. And then there are two more math um, classes that support that as well. Um, that are very content specific. I know there's one that's focused on geog or geometry as well. So if we look at, whoops, okay. sorry. <laughs> so then if we look at our um, MSTEP science and social studies, which are fifth grade and eighth grade. We know that 71 and a half percent of all of our fifth grade and 59.4 percent of all of our eighth graders were advanced proficient or proficient or even partially proficient in science. Um, again, we know that we have some room to grow, but we also know that our kids are growing and we're really excited about that. Um, for science, for social studies, um, fifth and eighth grade showed an increase in advanced proficient and proficient, partially proficient, um, especially compared with last year's scores. So um, again, we're hoping to see both of those um, social study scores increase as we as the kids start because the test is more aligned with what we are teaching. We go to the eighth grade PSAT. Our um, eighth graders. Um, just kind of rocked it last year. They showed an increased an increase in um, advanced proficient and proficient for evidence-based writing or reading and writing. And they also we had almost 70% of our students demonstrate advanced proficiency or proficiency or partial proficiency in math, with 64.5% of them being advanced proficient or proficient in evidence-based reading and writing. So we're super excited about um, how well our eighth graders are doing. Um, they continue to do well. The teachers work with students um, who struggle in the content areas um, so that they can demonstrate success. Um, this year was really exciting. Um, our 6th, 7th, and 8th graders and teachers, and specifically our 8th graders, ran a boot camp this year at the very beginning of the school year. And it really touched on things like the Microsoft platform, um, uh, creating Word documents, opening Word documents, accessing the OneDrive, doing uh, PowerPoint presentations, um, all things that our kids know how to do, but always need those refreshers at the beginning of the school year. And when they did it in this, they did it in this boot camp kind of an atmosphere where they traveled from class to class and learned different, um, or reminded of, or refreshed different types of um, computer programming or computer usage in the hopes that it doesn't take, it'll um, prevent taking away time in the classroom for them that should be used for instruction. So um, that was really exciting to actually see in action. And um, it was, I'm hoping that we uh, reap the benefit of that um, as we move forward. And of course, all of our students will have access to on-demand tutoring. 
All right. Um, so here we are with our NWA scores. Um, so if you look at our 2022-2023 scores compared with this year, we are trending in the right direction. Almost every single one of our grades, four of our five grade levels, um, reached or surpassed what their target was. But our fourth graders also still demonstrated growth. So even though they didn't reach their target, they still demonstrated growth. Um, this is, this fourth grade I'm, I'm really gonna keep an eye on. I'm, I'm not sure if this was an anomaly this year, or um, if, but we're gonna keep tracking their um, progress as fifth graders this year. Um, I'm, I, that's, that's a big gap and they should have met their growth and they didn't. But also, this was done in May, after they have already done all of their MSTEP. This was probably, this was the math was the last test that they took. And so, um, we are hoping, I'm sorry, language, it was language arts, was the last one that they took. And so, we're hoping that that will change and we'll see an increase as fifth graders this year. Um, and that we want all of our kids to meet or achieve their projected growth. Um, some of the things that we're also going to do is in our um, school improvement meetings, we're going to, as Billy has mentioned, talking about a way to adjust the testing schedules so that even if we can't change when our students take the NWA throughout the year, if we can figure out a way to make it more um, accessible for our students in a way that is not as overwhelming as maybe it was in the past, if we can try and figure out, be creative, and how we can actually um, administer the tests. We are also continuing, um, so that if we go um, and look at our language usage, again, all of our grade levels met their target, compared with last year's, with the exception of that fourth grade. Um, again, that's going to be the grade that we really keep our eye on as fifth graders. Um, one of the things that I also want to mention, too, is that the majority of the fourth grade staff last year was brand new, either to Richmond or to teaching. Um, uh, we are still providing them with a lot of support. They all have uh, mentors and will continue to grow and um, take advantage of professional development that is offered to move forward, especially with the Sabbath, um, which is what we have scheduled, as Billy said, for the remainder of the school year. Um, <clears throat> as we use this NWEA data, we can, um, as Andrea mentioned too, when we look at this data, we can help, when we cross-reference it with our MSTEP, MSTEP scores and even some more of our more local assessments, we can really figure out where those gaps are so that we can be more targeted and intentional with our instruction so that we can start to see, I want to get those fourth graders up to where they need to be as fifth graders, right? And that's what our goal is going to be this year. Um, this year, something um, we decided to do something a little bit different, and all of our fourth and fifth graders are being assessed using the Ames web testing, which before was only given to our students who we thought may be struggling based on their scores. And um, this is going to be a better way to provide our MTSS and intervention support for all of our students. And um, really looking forward to that. We do have a new support teacher at the middle school who will be working with our amazing paraprofessionals and they're going to continue to provide that intentional support. They're just finishing up the Ames web testing now. We have just a few glitches at the beginning of the year. Um, but it's all going to be done by the end of this week so that we can really start targeting um, that intentional instruction. And then this is our biggest point of pride is um, this is our math, our, our math scores for this year on NWEA. Um, every grade level overwhelmingly exceeded um, what their growth target was. So we're very, very proud of them for that, very excited about this. It's really fascinating to me to look at how poorly the fourth grade did on that, those first two, and they scored the highest in that. So I really am wondering if those two were the, the anomalous parts of it because of how we tested. So we, we just have to see how they do as fifth graders. So and we'll have data soon, actually. We'll have their first, um, uh, first NWBA data very soon. Um, 
One of the things, too, that I wanted to point out, one, um, and Billy said that we would talk about that and that I would address it. If you noticed on one of Billy's slides, the seventh graders did not show the same growth. Um, those seventh graders who are now eighth graders um, kind of started off in kindergarten um, a little bit, with needing a little bit more support than some of the other grades. And then I think really and truly, and I hate saying it, I hate saying the COVID word, but I have to say it, I think COVID really wreaked havoc on that particular grade level. I feel like they're like kind of the last of our, our lingering legacy. So we're hoping um, this year just just barraging them with a lot of information and um, and a lot of different strategies and hoping to see some growth, some more significant growth with them. Um, so then we have our points of pride. Um, we continue to show growth on MSTEP, PSAT, and NWEA. Our NWEA math scores improve significantly in each grade level, as I just showed you. Um, our staff is committed to improving student growth and achievement through team meetings, professional development, and DPPD. Um, we are trying something new at the middle school this year, very similar to what um, Heidi and Andrea are doing at their schools, and having team meetings during some common planning times. It's not as specific as we want as far as content goes, but, it, but we will be able to have some really rich conversations um, across grade levels and across content areas so that we can also look at this data and figure out how we can best target our kids to show that growth that we want them to show. Um, our fourth graders are number two in math in MSTEP in all of Macomb County. Our fifth graders are number three in science in all of Macomb County, and we are at the top 75 percent, 75th percentile in MSTEP in all of Macomb County, which is really exciting. Um, we do have some work to do, though. We'll continue to conduct frequent walkthroughs with intentional feedback. We've already started. Um, I, I think actually all three of us have started um, making those um, visits in those classrooms, seeing what's going on, um, looking at the instruction that's happening and providing some, some good feedback to our staff um, to segregate the fall data to support our instruction. Cross-reference MSTEP and WEA, like I've already said, and our local assessments to determine those learning gaps. Continue to provide on-demand tutoring for our student support and then continue to utilize our research-based adopted curriculum supports with Fidelity to um, further guide our instruction and hopefully show that growth that we want to see, especially in ELA this year. Any questions? I feel like I just talked a mile a minute. <laughs> Thank you. So as Ms. Uh, May Goody comes out, I just want to kind of highlight some things that Ms. Merle said. Um, we have put in place over the last couple of years interventions to address to try to catch students earlier. We've had in the past, we've had the intervention in math class, math introduction, six, seven, eight. We've had the, um, uh, the, the wheel this year, we added a piece. The new teacher that she spoke of regarding the, the title one, Ms. Walters, will now be at the elementary school full time. And then we have now three hours of the day rather than only two hours with our um, at risk or title one teacher there. So we're providing additional support to target those, those students that need it. In addition, we're still offering some high-end courses for those high-end kids to get them in accelerated courses. So it's been good. Okay, good evening. So we're going to talk about the elementary. We have a little less testing <laughs> as it comes, comes to MSTEP. We have our third grade, all of our eggs in one basket. So, um, the blue graph is Richmond, the orange graph represents the county, and the white graph, oh, I guess over there it's gray, um, represents the state. So this year in MSTEP, we are at 66.1% proficiency. So it was really, really exciting. So we were at 65.1% last year, and this year we're even up from that. So um, something to notice is we're up even 25% proficiency from our county. That's 21 counties, that's 112 elementary schools that our kids are outperforming. It's incredible. So I have had the ISD reach out to me and two local principals like, what are you doing? And so that's what I wanna talk about tonight because I think we're on a trend and we're seeing this year after year. These aren't the same kids and these aren't the same teachers. And so what we know is that good teaching is happening. That's what we know is that no matter who's in front of us, kids or teachers, good instructional practices practices are happening, so we're, we're really celebrating that. Um, 
So to back up last year, we had the 65.1%. We were number one in the county for the second year last year. We were excited. Well, fast forward, we had two third grade teachers retire, one take a, um, another position, um, Title I, in the building, and then a brand new curriculum. So you can only imagine. Poor Mr. Walmsley and Ms. Staples at the time because I was like, oh my gosh, it's just not going to be the same and it's going to take a lot and are we going to still be able to achieve the goal? It's just a lot of hurdles and barriers because even if you have teaching experience prior, when you come to a new school, you're learning all sorts of things plus a new curriculum. And then they ended up just making us so proud with good instruction and then um, becoming number one in the county again with three brand new teachers in third grade. So we're really excited about that. That was for math. And then for ELA, we have 52.5% proficiency. And then we are um, above the county average 15%. Um, so we are number two in the county for ELA. Um, we have a new curriculum, um, as you know, Savas, so we're excited about that. That's been a long time coming. So we're really, really excited about what that work is going to do in our ELA department. Um, but we think kind of coupled with our best practices that we know about, it's going to um, continue to improve. I meet with my teachers every Tuesday um, for PLC. So it seems like a lot, and I know it's weekly, and it's a big commitment for me and, and them behind closed doors. But what we're finding is just what the need is in the building. So I have to thank you guys, because whether it's really just a teacher needs manipulatives to teach fractions better. I'm going to Tammy and saying, hey, can we amend maybe this? Or I'm going to Mr. Walsey and saying, hey, can we adjust this? Or to Billy, you know, what is the third grade reading law saying again, help me? So I mean, it's just been an incredible team effort for what it takes for this to happen. So I want to thank everybody because it takes all the pieces, you know. Lisa Rand, this computer isn't working and we're testing. I mean, it's just, a, it's a whole team. So it's um, exciting. And so again, this is just a repeat, but just highlighting that we're number one in Macomb County for the third year in a row. So again, different kids, different educators, and just uh, good things going on in the classroom. 10 higher than number two, right? Yes, and we're 10% higher than the number two school in Macomb County. So we're really, when we say we're outperforming, um, we are really outperforming. So it's exciting. Um, so again, this is our third grade ELA, so we're number two. Um, we're not really going to settle for number two, <laughs> so we're pretty competitive. Um, but we are, you know, we still celebrate this, but we know that we want to just keep going. So, what did they tell you? you could say this. We number beat the one. school to the west. To the west. Can I say it? Can I say it? Sure can. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's exciting. So for our, um, this is our math. Um, NWA, so what I really like about this is that we always wonder if there's a correlation between NWA and M-STEP testing. They say that there is, they claim, but you can see it here that there really is. Um, you can look at the projected growth and then the blue line is, is the growth. So you can see that, you know, our third grade, but it takes everybody. So, um, so we're moving in that direction. We actually um, have a third grade teacher speaking to our second grade teachers tomorrow in our PLC because second grade teachers are going, we don't understand why our kids are, you know, this is happening with this lesson and, you know, so they want to know. So Mr. Gibson's going to cover a class while our third grade teacher teaches second grade. So we're excited about doing these kinds of things because we want to keep seeing these uh, orange diamonds drawing. So. And then for reading, again, we're, um, our observed growth is above where they project us to be and that's the goal. We want our kids to be performing at the highest level possible. And so some of the things that we're doing, I've talked a little bit about it, but some of the things we're doing, um, November 5th, we have a pocket of time after the SABIS, our new curriculum training, and we do an NWA data dive. And so teachers are expected to create um, particular groups for every student in their classroom. Because during intervention time, we do a thing called all hands on deck. So all kids are learning at their level at that time for 45 minutes. Well, we have to know what skill level they need. So for NWA, when your student gets a 147 on the geometry mark, it will tell you what they're ready for. So they might be ready for 3D shapes, they might be ready for edges, or um, you know, all those types of things. So we're really trying to nail down, like we're getting away from kids are good at reading or not good at math. We're really trying to say, this is just what the student needs. It's, it's really neither, it's just, where are they in the whole trajectory? Because we're seeing a lot of kids that are really good, maybe with operations and numbers, like over the grade level, but they're here in geometry. So if we just group them in these, in these levels of just being mm, average or maybe just above average, it doesn't really get us to where we wanna go. 
So we're trying to kind of be the surgeons. Um, another thing is, is this district has done a phenomenal job in making research their rock. So, you know, there's fads and there's things that come in education, and we all know it. Um, Deb, you know probably, you've seen it and felt it, but we're really focusing on things that are research-based, and I think we're getting that back down to the basics where we're becoming experts at the things we're doing, and we're not just doing all the things that are out there. Like we have promises, we're like, we're doing Kagan, you know, we're all doing it, we're getting the training and we're keeping up with it and how do we get even our new teachers so we're not just kind of letting it lapse. That's a big conversation we have with Billy and with Brian is that, you know, how are new teachers going to be guaranteed to get this training too? Because we don't want it to just be a thing or a fad. So, um, so I think that's really great. The district is doing research-based practices. We do Haggerty at the elementary, so that's a lot of um, phonemes, phonemic segmentation. And we do a lot of non-negotiables at the elementary that we come up with mostly together, sometimes <laughs> by me, but <laughs> it's a compromise. Um, but some of the promises are like guided reading every day, seeing our tier three students every day. We do Haggerty four times a week, number talks four times a week. So these are the things that we want to come in and be seeing all the time. So that way it doesn't matter if you have like Mrs. H or Mrs. B in second grade, you're getting an equitable learning experience. And you really can only do that through like creating these promises. You can put your own spin on it, and we recognize that like teaching, you know, we're all our own kind of teacher, but what you're putting in front of the kids needs to be the same. So we've done, I think, a really good job having promises to kids and commitments to kids of what we're, they're going to have. And then our points of pride, um, nothing new that what we already talked about, but uh, top proficiency in math and number three in the county for three years in a row even with new curriculum and three new teachers to the district. Uh, the last two years we were top in ELA, this year we're number two in the county. Um, we're closing the gap even in NWA, which is then translating to MSTEP. And then we're always really proud of having 100% teacher retention. Um, we just don't have teachers leaving us, which is awesome, unless they retire. They do that sometimes, darn it. <laughs> but um, we just, we really are, um, I have a big belief that culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you've ever heard that quote, and I think it starts with, we want kids who want to love to be at school. We got to start there. We got to have teachers that love their jobs and love to teach. And if we can get all that going, then we can get to this stuff. So I think we're on the road to creating that. So kids are excited to learn. So I think that's it. Yes. So any other questions or? The only question I have is I know you're going to do this presentation on the 21st at your community thing. Is it this presentation and are you doing questions and answers? Are you doing it like that, like, like the last one? Yeah. It wasn't like the last one, but um, our, our plan that we've discussed is a little bit more on the test itself, like the reasons for testing. Okay. So a little less data, a little bit more just what is the test about testing culture. Certainly we'll touch on the data, but it'll be a little bit more what it's about and, and what it's for versus our scores overall. All the those will be touched on. Right, and you. absolutely question and answer. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I would just like to leave you with this. And you need to think, take a, get in the plane and go 30,000 feet up. And look at this district in the last five, 10, 10 years. We've had a lot of bumps and turbulence in our in our in our district. Every district has. You have people who retire. You got to bring in new people and train them. You have uh, people who choose to go somewhere else. You bring in you bring in experienced people. That that is a normal phenomenon in any district, right? In any corporation, for that matter. But I want you to look, listen to this. And I just wrote down some points as I heard all three. And I think for the first time that I can honestly say we are all growing in the same direction. Think about this. You heard from all three buildings, grade level content planning meetings, on prep hours, before schools, on Tuesdays, consistent throughout all three buildings. You heard a lot of data discussion. What does this mean and how can I take it and move and make my students better? You heard about um, uh, intentional. We do things for specific reasons because it's right for kids. Right? Fidelity came across a lot. That's part of in education. When we don't do things with fidelity, you're not going to see results. 
And if we just get on that bandwagon and do it for one year, you're not going to see long term. None of this is going to happen overnight. We're not going to go from 50% to 100% overnight. It takes time. But I think the, the biggest thing that I see, or, or I'll, I'll leave with just two things, is number one, creating a culture where the administrative team has a very high expectation of their staff. This team um, does a lot together, picking up the phone, talking to each other, whether it was Renee in previous years and now Billy not now. Um, Robert Marzano, uh, leader, researcher and so forth, talks about the impact that the leadership has on a building. And when you have effective leadership, that has a strong impact on the culture and what's going to happen in that building. And you have to have that for the building to move forward. If you have someone just that, that's processing and just going through, you're not going to get the results. You heard in here, you know, I talk about intentional, purposeful, fidelity. Walking into classrooms, having those conversations. This is what I'm looking for when I'm going into class. And it's not anything that's Ms. Morella's thing she's looking for, or Ms. Mangoon, or Ms. Leo. These are best practices. These are what research says. If kids are engaged in this, they will do well. I have I have said multiple times, and sometimes I have a relapse, and I go back, but multiple times, we shouldn't teach to the test. If we're teaching good instruction, the results will come. And you are seeing this chip away over the last, and I, and I look at I can only speak to my tenure, the 10 years. We had great years, we took some dips, we went up, we're back up. And again, I just ask you to reflect on that process and those things that I talked about. Because this truly is a, a not only a remarkable administrative team, but we have a staff that is really remarkable. They want the best for the kids, and, they, and they're willing to, um, to have those conversations and try things out and see if they work or don't work. So, um, yes, yeah, some of the results are not what any of us want, but I think the public needs to recognize if the state of Michigan has a score that's what some people just look at the score might not be acceptable, look at the type of questions they're asking, our kids are being asked. This isn't the meat test when it was created as a basic skill. This is not a basic skills test. This is testing higher order thinking skills. And sometimes you hear this, the concept about new math and the way I did it was this way. It's, it's not new math, it's teaching kids there's more than one way to solve a problem. Because look what they're being asked to do. <coughs> I mean, some of the questions that Billy shared up there, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, I had to second guess myself because I was like, well, I don't even know what the answer is on that one. Because <laughs> they're, they're challenging. And then when you couple, couple all that together with just being a kid, being a kid who also has, we want them to have fun in school, we want them to do all the social aspects of school. This isn't about testing, it's about educating kids. And I'll, and I'll, find, I'll leave with this. Richmond graduates are successful in the real world. And if just sample, just look at the last two years of our academic and hall of honor. I mean, our, our graduates are going all over the world. They're successful whether they're in programs or whether they're in trade, owning their own businesses, they are successful. Um, so I'll leave with that. I, I do want to thank the administrators and Billy tonight. Um, it, it is a pleasure working with all of them because it isn't about, um, though Heidi has a little competition over there, she's very competitive. <laughs> it isn't about keeping it to yourself. <laughs> it's about, okay, what can we do? What are you doing in your building? Maybe I can replicate that. We also recognize each of our buildings is three very different cultures. Three very different cultures. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. I too just wish to thank Billy and our administrators for being here this evening and presenting this data. Did a nice job. Okay, we're going to move on. Our next item on our agenda is our proposed overnight extended trip request. I think we have Mr. Berg here. Good evening, everybody. Oh, that was so, I was laughing because I'm sitting back there looking at the data and I couldn't see anything on that screen other than the little. I know, we got to make a note to dive in. And it looked like it was going down. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm glad it was looking yeah, over here. <laughs> but, anyways, um, I'm here tonight because I'm proposing an overnight um, study trip to Ohio, which we've done for the past few years. Um, we are leaving, um, or at least. Planning on leaving 12:13, staying that night, 
um, because we have a tournament that day um, in Finley, Ohio for the Roughneck Duels. And then we stay the night and then there is another tournament. It's the same tournament, it's a two-day tournament, 12-14. Um, um, we will be leaving um, weigh-ins are at noon that Friday, 12-13. So the wrestlers will have to uh, leave school a little early. Um, they will be expected to have all their work ahead of time and order whatever they can and I mean, it's on them to make that up. And then, yes. um, for our drive situation, um, I will be driving my um, van that will take about 11 or 10 kids. Coach uh, Sean Misko will be driving. And if we need another driver, um, Coach Nick Berg will also, he has a minivan as well that we'll be taking, so we do not need any uh, parental assistance in that, in that case. Um, yeah, it's a really, really good tournament. Um, we've been going to it for a couple of years, a few years now. It has teams at all level. It's great to expose the kids to some of the best teams in Ohio. Um, and to just get them in a new environment. It's uh, at a college university, the University of Finley. So they get to see that campus. They get to see their workout facility. It's, it's actually really, really nice. They switched from Defiance, Ohio. I think it was the University of Defiance a couple years ago. Now it's Finley, and that's actually a lot nicer. So, that's about Any questions from the board? Your hotel costs? Um, the hotel costs will be covered um, by the RWAA. Um, we fundraise, so all that will be taken care of from them. Um, so how many, about how many kids do you have going? We will take roughly 20, 25 of them. Okay, and then what, like what grades or what age groups is that? Oh, this is high school. So just this is just, school. yep, 12 through 9th grade. Okay. And then all of those kids then they have to be eligible prior to getting in a car and going. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah if they're ineligible, we leave them home. Okay. <laughs> I mean, school's first. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? No, nah, I'm just going to comment. It's a great tournament. We go every year and have gone for years. It's, it's a really good exposure for our kids, um, the competition level in that. And I'm excited that we'll continue. Yeah, I've, 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 ever since I've gone, it's really, really amazing to see how the kids can, it, it's an intense tournament where there's, they have to wrestle 10 duels in two days. And after we wrestle our home tournament, and then we go there, and actually we're going to be going to Macomb, half our season will be done before January, and then we'll have that middle of the season to train, which is kind of ideal for us. Any other questions? Thank you. We'll be voting oh. on the next person this week. Next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item on our agenda is our Blue Devil Raids. Uh, Tracy. and her custodial staff and Kathy and the food service staff for the great work for our Hall of Fame Hall of Honor um, a couple weeks ago. It was a beautiful event and um, Cynthia, you just continue in your work with the honorees and other people that come to make us look good. So I appreciate, I appreciate you very much doing that. Um, and also to Preston and Brian for their work help you get it together with the foundation. Um, you make us look good as well. Um, I want to rave Sandy uh, on the board as participating in the Scarecrow contest. Is that what it's called? Oh, geez. <laughs> it's like, I, I have the floor. <laughs> and Sandy put together our uh, Scarecrow, and it is down by the Kmart. Yeah, the tractor supply. Tractor supply. I just dated myself when I called it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's, it's <laughs> fabulous. It's all her creation. If you drive by and look at it, it's, it's amazing. So thank you for doing that. And then I just want to send a rave out to uh, the Ricks, Capozo, Aldani, and Migrant families who hosted 
uh, flow building in their homes. We thank them for that. And we, I just, that it's a big thing for me is bringing the flow building back. So for those families to open their homes and their kids and have kids in their houses, thank you for that. Um, that is a success. That's it. Thank you very much. Candace? Yes, there's been so much that's going on the past two weeks. Um, yes, thank you, Sandy, for putting all that together. And uh, I, I wanted to give out a huge shout out to the um, high school marching band for getting their first division training last week. Um, and they did an amazing job. And I couldn't have been more prouder to be a part of that event and watch all the different, maybe there's seven or nine different high school bands. A lot, I mean, yes, a lot of different. It was very fun and very entertaining to watch. If anyone ever has a chance to go to that, very entertaining. Um, and what else? Yes, thank you to all the families that hosted the parade, decorating for the homecoming too. It was very sweet, and um, the kids I know loved doing that too. So, mm -hmm. that's it. Thank you, Kate uh, Um Yeah, I want so. I don't even know who it is to shout out, um, but last the end of last week on Thursday and Friday on the elementary school um, playground when the kids were walking in in the morning, um, there was a staff member out there with a sheet of stickers, and she was passing them out as kids came in. She's like, "Oh, you have a smile on your face. Here's a sticker today." And you could hear her all the way out in the parking lot, you know, as I'm watching Jackson walk in, and. Um, so, and then there was kids who weren't smiling, and so this kind of goes with what Ms. Mangooney was saying of kids wanting to be excited to come to school. So kids that weren't smiling heard her say that to others and get stickers, so then they're like, I'm smiling too, and you could hear them, I'm smiling too, and so she gave them the sticker as well, and she did that Thursday and Friday. Um, so that was really neat, and that was really cute, and Jackson even came home Thursday after school and still had it on his hand and was so proud of it and bragging about look, I got the sticker this morning because I was smiling. And so um, I think that was a really nice touch. I haven't seen that in the last you know, couple of years of just being around. Um, and so that was something new and different and the kids just fed right off of that and loved that. So I'm not sure who she was, but <laughs> thank you for doing that. I think that's part of their goal, you know, that best day of school ever that they talked about at the beginning and the 1% changes that they can make to get kids excited and, and learn. That's part of the big picture. But yeah, it's about all staff members doing something mm -hmm. so that kids want to be in school. Sandy? Yeah, so I also, um, on my reading list, had uh, Cynthia and Kathy um, for the Hall of Honor and um, the whole homecoming weekend. I mean, they really do um, outdo themselves. It was a fantastic event, you know, to the game, to Sunday, and so I just, I really appreciate their efforts, um, and Brian and Preston as well. Um, I think it's a really cool event, and it, it's, it's, it's only our second year, and I think it's gotten better. Um, so thank you to you guys for doing that. Um, it's it's a definitely appreciated. Um, and, I, and I also did want to, um, to say thank you to Margaret for making the Education Foundation look so good up there, because um, you spoke very well and represented us very well, so thank you for that. But um, I also, am, I believe, I, uh, I believe the kid's name is Austin. Um, but I went to the pumpkin sale for the band and the choir. I think it's just the band and the choir, right? Yeah. Um, I went to that sale, as I do every year, and got some stuff for um, my Halloween yard. Um, but um, I was talked into, I believe, by Austin. Um, he was a very big help. He was he up, sold me big time. <laughs> and, he was, um, and he was very proud of it. And I ended up buying the raffle tickets, which I normally wouldn't have done, but I did win the big pumpkin, which now, yeah which now probably sits in my front yard. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to think, I think his name was Austin, so I'll have to, maybe I'll figure it out and 
yeah, he was a very good salesperson, and I appreciate him um, for making me do that. Um, I also, yeah, I also did have uh, wanted to shout out the high school band, um, marching band for their the Division One rating. That's amazing. They are always fun to watch, um, no matter no matter where, no matter what. Just even practicing. So if, if anybody has the opportunity to do that, do you guys have a concert? I'm sorry, no, because you're in the band. Do you guys have a concert coming up for the fall? Because sometimes there's a fall concert, isn't there? For um, just like the band, like in the auditorium or anything, or um, we all we do the, uh, the um, is it concert spring? in the winter time. Or in the winter time. Okay. Yes. Okay. And we okay, do so. like a Christmas theme. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. But we do have we'll be performing again in the marching band next okay. week, next Friday. All right. This is a, do you know if the choir is doing one in the fall? They yes. Do yes. Every other year. Okay. Yeah. They okay. are. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um. So, anyways, I think that that's yeah. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, since I haven't been in town, I don't have <laughs> anything. You guys, thanks for representing the board at events and activities that went on that I missed. I appreciate it. Okay, next item on our agenda is our student uh, board and educate our student board of education reps. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe or Elizabeth. Uh, we'll start Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for the high school, Ms. Abel stated earlier that tomorrow, um, October 15th, PSATs are being taken by the 11th grader. Okay. <laughs> um, so then, uh, year two and three teacher cadets entered their classrooms um, last Monday. Um, I'm in Mr. Gordon's third grade class. Um, we're all adjusting really well. We need to store our classrooms. Um, manufacturing day took place on Monday, September 30th, and Thursday, October 3rd. Um, they wanted to say thank you. So, Synergy prototype stamping and I don't want to say D, 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 what works? And then they welcomed 40 total students into their businesses. Um, Marching Band Showcase was Monday, September 30th at 7 p.m. The same week as homecoming. Um, homecoming week was very eventful for high school. Spirit days included purple and yellow day, flower theme day, powder puff color day, um, seniors were black, 11th oh, were pink, 10th um, graders were blue, and then 9th grade was yellow. Thursday was pajama day, and then Friday was blue and white day. Um, congrats to the class of 2025 for winning um, the Powder Book theme. And then float building was a success. Students built floats with a tangled theme, and congrats to the sophomores for winning. Um, and then the dance was Saturday, October 5th at 7 o'clock. And then for the middle school, there's a great turnout for parent teacher conferences with over 850 conferences. Um, staff would like to thank parents for coming in and taking the time to talk to their teachers. Um, Positive View began last week with the first week's lesson being on core values, and this week's lesson focusing on positive beliefs. Um, they're very excited for sixth and eighth grader students to benefit from this program. Um, also, going on at the middle school, we got uh, Friday the 11th, our fourth and fifth graders participated in an energy presentation provided by National Energy Foundation. It was really awesome. Students learned about how energy works. You know what we can do to conserve it. It was really awesome talking about future benefits and whatnot, whether it may have been careers or just out of interest. Um, middle School's annual Boo Bash will be held on Friday, October 25th, whoop, whoop, with uh, fourth and fifth graders attending from 3 to 4.30, uh, and sixth and seventh and eighth graders attending from 5 to 6.30. Um, super grateful, PTO, for hosting such a fun event. It's going to be super awesome, super exciting. Um, we have nothing to present to you from the elementary school this time. We will come around with some information uh, soon. In terms for athletics, uh, a couple teams have finished up their seasons. Uh, boys soccer finished a season strong uh, over at New Haven and a tie with North Branch before losing to a good Carter Mooney team uh, in district quarterfinals. But you know, still really awesome. Girls golf is over. Um, they improved their regional score by 11 strokes. From last season, I'm very bad at golf. I can, but I, I can tell. That is awesome. That's pretty good. Yeah, That's super cool. Um, homecoming was a wonderful success. Football scored a big win over Emily City, and they are looking to play, uh, make a playoff push these last two weeks against Elginac and Lance Cruz North. Our volleyball teams continue to gear up for the postseason. All three teams will be in action at home tomorrow against GL. Good luck to them. And Cross Country has their final BWAC Jamboree tomorrow and their regional race on Saturday. Other than that, students are having a great time here. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Next item on our agenda is our student board of, I'm sorry, they just did that. <laughs> our superintendent and legislative update, Mr. Wallace So I'll add to one of the students for the elementary, you might have seen on Facebook uh, or social media, they launched their uh, book vending machine. So as oh, kids yeah. are going to be positive, it is, it is really cool. So if you haven't had a chance to go over to the elementary, it's in the lobby, take a minute to stop over there. Um, First State Bank and the Richard Lions Club gave significant donations along with the PTO there um, to get that. And um, you know, if we got incentivized, we're incentivizing reading books. So and the kids are loving it over there. So um, let's get positive over there. So. Before you move on, though, I have a question. So I did see that on there. What's the golden ticket thing about, though? Like, you get a golden ticket and you get to, like, how does that work? So they, in their PBIS program, they you know? they earn blue tickets uh -huh. that they um, put into, like, a drawing. Mm -hmm. and pull from that to be the winners of the of what you got. And it's looking for not not behaviors that you're supposed to be doing, but looking for behaviors that, you know, are going above and beyond what they're, they're focusing on. But so what do you get when you get the golden ticket? You get to go to the vending machine. Oh, and you get to get a and book. pick any of the books that are in the vending machine. Oh, okay, cool. That, that's what I thought. I just wasn't sure if you, like, if it was something extra special, like Charlie and Chocolate Factory going to Okay. <laughs> they, they do. I mean, they, not that the book is not extra special. That's right. not what I meant. But I just meant like, you know. Okay. They do They do special <laughs> weekly treats. Like they'll, they'll do pops them with the principal. Yeah, I know. That's cool. Okay. So but it is really cool. They have launched it. I Very can't cool. think of First State Bank and the Richard Lions Club for donating to help support that. Absolutely. As well as uh, the lead PTO really um, kind of spearheaded it. So. Very cool. That's great. Um, it's been three weeks since our last regular board meeting. So, because we had that fifth uh, Monday in September. So, um, since our last board meeting, um, three of the board members here, board member uh, Cunningham and Pelto and Fortuno, and I went to the Macomb County School Board Association uh, where we got to see the forum for the State Board of Education. It was very informative. Um, as a public school advocate, uh, I encourage people to do their research and their background. Um, for that, all the candidates were there. Um, Tom McMillan is a Republican, Adam Zemke is a Democrat, Mickey Snyder, Republican, and then Dr. Theodore Jorn, Jones, excuse me, a Democrat, they were all there. Um, though uh, Mickey Snyder chose not to participate, um, she had read her prepared speech and then chose not to participate. But in this day and age where public schools are oftentimes attacked or criticized, I think it's really important for people, really with any position, but for public schools who are making decisions and policies about for our students in the state to really become educated on the candidates that are sitting on that board and making decisions. So um, just I encourage the community to do their do their research. On Wednesday, September 5th, shortly after our last board meeting, Ms. Zabo, Ms. Uh, Mr. Osborne, the high school counselor, Ms. Morella, and Ms. May and I all went to the ISC, spent the day out there for hatching results. As your results, uh, I, I talked about, talk about it at the last board meeting, but it's a countywide effort to improve the school counseling program. And it was presented about a year ago to the County School Board Association. Uh, we got in it towards the end of last year. This year is really focusing on how you're taking your tier one, where you're giving all services for all kids, and focusing on the tier two. So once you have kids that you've received it, I'll, just, I'll be more uh, kind of a, a, a very simplistic example. We give um, FAFSA information to all kids, and that's part of the counselor's re results or, or job. And getting kids to apply for FAFSA opens up enrollments and scholarship. But we might have a group of kids that are not, so what's the counselor doing for that group of kid to get them to fill it out, or and so forth. Or you do scheduling for all kids, and then you have a group of kids that they just don't know what they want to do. So then you take in, what are you focusing the energies on that group of kids? So it's a tiered approach, but it's really looking at the school uh, we often kind of pass, we used to call it guidance counseling, it's more a school counseling program. Um, so I, um, kudos to uh, Ms. Zabel, Ms. Morella, Mr. Osborne, and Ms. May, because they have had a lot of rich uh, dialogue uh, between this year. Billy and I will probably tag team, you know, going back and forth to this to be part, because we want to show our support for them and what uh, the importance of our school counselors. Um, as you heard multiple times, last, the week of September 30th was homecoming. It was filled with spirit days, bonfires, powder puff games, pep assemblies, homecoming parades, games, um, and dances. Um, this is our second year bringing floats back. Um, they were, uh, there's been a growth 
in our float production uh, this year <laughs> as compared to last year going on the, the theme of data, looking at data. Um, the students and staff did a great job. I too want to echo the parents, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Ron, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Moldani, uh, the Capozo family and the Ricks family for opening up. It's, it's a lot of work. I know it may not seem like just, you know, a lot of responsibility. Maybe I'll put it that way. And um, they did it. Um, we're always looking for ways to get more kids involved in it. So we're, we're reflecting on our homecoming and looking at the time frame, et cetera. Um, you mentioned, I mentioned earlier about the Academic Hall of Honor and Athletic Hall of Fame. It was a great turnout on uh, Sunday the 6th of uh, October. Um, there was even some class of 23 uh, inductees and, and people who were there last year who came back. Um, what I really appreciated was the stories and um, the acceptance speeches by all the inductees. It really made you proud to be associated with Richmond schools. Um, you know, some speeches we learned about a lot of information. <laughs> very valuable. Um, you've heard a couple times, tomorrow starts the uh, practice uh, free on-demand tutoring for all families. These are on, on classroom, they're supposed to be on classroom doors, if not they will be. It's on the website, it's on the social media, it's free. Um, we partnered with practice last year to kind of pilot it. It had very good reviews. Uh, the concept is not just uh, circumvent instruction in the classroom, but um, Speaking for my own kids, when you have kids at home and you're at night trying to help with homework, sometimes moms and dads don't know anything. <laughs> and so this is another resource or a resource if you have a topic that you really don't know. Um, to It's a free resource. You can really schedule it within 10, you know, it says 24 hours, but in some cases you do 10 minutes before the session and it's free. Um, and you can have multiple sessions. So um, I encourage people to, to utilize it, especially if they're struggling or just want to review some concepts, especially before exams, etc. Um, you heard parent-teacher conferences. Um, it was a great turnout. We still offer the virtual and in-person. Um, we had a good turnout for both. Um, since our at the last board meeting, I talked about the community conversation with the superintendent, which focused on school safety. This evening, a letter went out to families, and it's on the on the website. On October 21st, we're going to talk about school uh, school assessments. Um, as Billy said, it's not necessarily about the data, but understanding the assessments, the purpose of the assessments, uh, why we choose to use certain assessments, and why we don't get to choose, and so forth. On that aspect. Um, our next one, uh, this one's October 21st, which is next Monday. The November one will focus on school finance and funding. Um, the November board meeting will have the presentation on the audit. And so we'll follow that up with the community on um, kind of understanding where all our funds that come from um, from a school system perspective. Um, you might see on the advertising that the lottery money does go to schools. And yes, it does. 100% of it does. But there's also so many politics that happen behind the scenes that people aren't often aware of um, and so forth. And what time is that then on the they're, they're all at 6.30 and they will be at the media center here at the high school. So they're both the 21st and the November one. Um, I don't have the November date off the top of my head, it's the third Monday in November. Uh, on October 3rd, uh, Governor Whitmore signed into law a House Bill 5803, it's also known as the Public Act 127 of 2024. Uh, this bill I spoke uh, previously about, um, it was inter uh, sponsored by Representative Matt Colazar, uh, which basically makes our MIPSERS rate uh, permanently decreased by 5.75%, uh, which is huge. Um, in the past, any reduction in that retirement rate has always been a categorical or section grant in the, in the school aid. Um, this is permanent, so they would have to actually permanently they'd have to vote to permanently increase it in the law statute. So it's not a fight every year. Um, it also eliminates beginning October 1st of 2025, the 3% that employees have to contribute to the health care. Uh, the health care is funded at about 150%, so it's well funded. Um, if you recall this money from the MISRs and that 3%, um, many of the legislators, and to some extent the governor at the, at the time, wanted to keep that money and reshuffle it to the economic development, it's called the SOARS program. Uh, but there was a lot of pushback uh, from the education community, from, from all, all types of groups, and basically said, 
we committed to making this reduction or paying this uh, uh, this more these dollars more towards the to paying this debt down. Now that it's paid, that money should stay at the schools or stay in the employees' um, basically uh, pocketbook, which is what it does. Um, the last thing uh, I just want to uh, give an update on. Um, there was an incident that happened on September 29th, and I just want to give some context because there is a lot of speculation. And um, you know, on the 29th at, at late in the evening, I just sent a brief message to parents. Um, there was a, a incident that happened. Um, we got an okay to say report that made um, a disturbing statement. We knew who the, the, the student that was involved and the police were involved and so I made the decision that night because we did not have a lot of information that night so we knew students would be safe but to give parents an update on what happened um, if you go on social media it's still on there and there's probably pages and pages of uh, people waiting in on it um, following that incident there were several students who opted not to make good choices that week, whether it was the words they used or responding to people um, and so forth. And, and I don't want to say kids are going to be kids because we expect kids to make mistakes, but they, they made poor choices in that week and how, and how they responded to that. Um, but I think what I what I I think we all need to kind of step back and reflect as the adults in our community. Because if you read that thread on some of them, um, some of them have been deleted. People have chosen to delete their, their, their posts, etc. Um, there were statements by adults that were attacking students. And when you just say that statement itself, and I'll probably get blasted for saying it, because I'm not here yelling at parents, I'm not critiquing parents, but we're the adults in this community, and we're talking about a minor who for right or wrong reason, made some poor choices, and we're attacking this person on social media. That's just not acceptable. I, I don't. I don't care. I, I hope. I don't care who you are. It's just not acceptable. Um, and what what I know a lot is frustrating for a lot of parents is we're dealing with a minor, and there's a lot of information I cannot share. I cannot share history, I cannot share background, I can't share whether that child's back in school, whether that child's not back in school, or children, I shouldn't just say child, because there, there's multiple kids that, that were involved in some, some fashion of the events that, that took place. All I can ask is that, um, you heard tonight the passion that our administrative team and our teachers have just about student data. It's probably tenfold about safety in this district. Um, we spent last month talking about school safety. It was not a very well attended event, but um, the letter that went out, when you look at the number of people that read it, at least they've read it. They've opened up and read and talked about all the safety. Um, when I look at our team, and I, I say that broadly because it's not just about the administrative team, it's about the central office team, it's about custodians, it's about the building security, it's about everybody. The amount of safety protocols that we put in place training we've done with staff, the infrastructure improvements we've done to make sure um, that our kids and staff are safe. Um, but I don't think people realize the amount of after hours work our team does. And you think about it, this was a call at 9 o'clock on a Sunday. And some people may already be in bed at that. But from 9 o'clock to 11, this administrative team was working on a solution for Monday morning. The amount of times we get, we talked about the gaggle, um, which monitors student content, the threats that we're calling the police to go do wellness checks because the student might have put some harm message that they're going to do harm to themselves. I, I don't think parents realize that this is not an 8 to 3 job for our team. And I say that with teachers too. We have teachers calling and reporting it's because they, they see something or hear something from a student. And um, I just hope, and maybe, maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I hope that this community realize that none of us here want anything ever to happen to anybody in this district. And we are dedicated to make sure we do, do everything we can but it does rely on a trust that the people in this district are doing what they should be doing. 
And I think in our society, especially in the last couple years, trust has kind of gone away. There's skepticism, there's um, uh, mistrust or, or a belief that people aren't doing it. And I, and I only say this, and I apologize if it sounded like a, a platform. You know, I said this in the, in the student data. We are truly all row, rowing in the same direction from this board all the way down through the organization. And things like this deter us from putting our energy where it needs to be, our kids in this district. And so I would just hope that people would just take a step back. I'm not, I'm not scolding anybody in this organization, I'm not scolding anybody who takes social, but just take a step back and look how we all respond. I'm guilty too, we're all, we're all human, we make errors. But when you start attacking people who are watching our kids from seven hours to eight hours a day, it does take a toll on people in this organization. Um, this situation I described, there has been many people in this organization that have been sleepless nights because they have, did they make the right decision? They're, 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 you know, or, or spent hours just looking through the safety protocols to make sure we crossed our T's and dotted our I's. And, I'm happy to say we've done everything we can. I'll leave you with this. All of this, though, starts from the home. The way kids are raised and the values that are in their home, we can't teach that in school. We can encourage ethics and we can encourage character traits, but it does start in the home. And, and parents have to be active with their students. They have to know what social media sites they're on. When they're telling their kids that, I want you off the social media, verify they're getting off of it. So um, that's all I have to say. I just I felt I needed because the administrative, the, not only the administrative, but the teaching staff, everybody who was part of the last couple, um, I'm, I'm impressed. I, 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 wouldn't, I can't be more proud of the organization of how they've handled it. And I would just hope that um, people would help give us the benefit of the doubt that we are here for the best of That's all I have. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is our uh, items of interest from the board. Uh, Danielle, anything? Very good. Uh, Tracy. Uh, Candace. Yes. Um, so, is there, <clears throat> I, because I, going back to the incident that occurred, I know that we handed that off to the, to the police at some point that evening to look into everything. But after that gets handed off, there's never anything that comes back. And so it, it is kind of like open-ended when we get your generic letter. I can see how we don't see the full circle on that in, in the end result, and it's not your fault at all. It's not anything that we're doing. But it would be nice to get something from them, even if they, because they have their own case this is what happened, we're into it, da, da, da. some sort of, because I'm, I'm not even so sure that they're questioning what we're doing, but then once it's passed off, if that makes sense, that they, nobody hears anything back about, and not that we need the details, but that it's been handled, just that little piece of, I, but I, how would, do you, I would, I would, I would, I believe that we did that. We addressed this on two, Sunday night. We said basically this is well, what we had at that time. This is being handled with, in cooperation with the police. The police have gone to the home. If I'm a police, think about this from the public. If I'm a police officer and I go to someone's home and I do the wellness check and I check for all the stuff that police do. And they leave there without arresting someone. There's a, the police are saying this is not a threat. There's a threat they would have immediately done something. The follow-up letter on Monday, I explained exactly what I did. In fact, I even explained what we had on Monday, Sunday night. We didn't even have the picture. We didn't have the full story. But we erred on the side of caution to at least, we knew if kids were going to be safe. But we knew if I, I knew if I didn't tell parents, they would have thought I put their child in jeopardy. So I, I erred on it. And so we explained the process that we went through in the follow-up letter that talked did we give some specific? Did I say student A, B, and C? 
are coming back to school tomorrow or you not at school tomorrow. I can't because I can't give that information. And Did I say police? Correct. And and, and we're you know I can say in every case that there is a situation, the Richmond police have been directly involved in all of those situations, and we're between the team here and the police. We're we're what's the best strategy to address? It? We call them off and just to do wellness. Hey, you know, we get gag alerts that a student wants to commit harm to himself. Can you go? Because we can't get a hold of mom and dad. Can you go to that house and physically talk to them? Ninety-nine percent of the time, I was just joking. I didn't mean anything about it. Which is, I'm glad it's that, not the serious. But um, the closure is what's hard, and it goes back to that. And it, it just goes back to trust that we are closing out the process. There is a process. And what we have is you've got different laws based on different kids. If you've got a kid over here who's a general ed, no, nothing, I have to follow certain laws. If I have a kid over here that is special, special needs or a 504 or a health plan, there are different things that we have to do that I can't tell any parent that information. That's the challenge that we have in this. It's yeah, but you're not putting kids in danger no. because of those laws. That's correct. You know, no, that's no, that's what we no. need to be clear about. Like that's not. Do you know what I mean? Like you're not. That's not happening. And of course, we can't share, or you can't share that info. You know, sensitive information. Just like the police can't. You know, and that's is hard as a parent with the students these days. That's hard. Um, but we have to also understand that because if it were our student that made a poor choice and made just a poor decision, you know what I mean? We wouldn't want our student blasted all over the place either because kids, kids can make poor decisions and not um, and not be a serious threat. Um, and obviously the police nor us can can broadcast any of that information because and nor should you if you really think about it and self reflect, nor should you want us to. Because you wouldn't if it was your kid. But I also think that it, it comes with, we, that information went out, the letter went out explaining that the police were involved, and then that follow up with the police. So the, these people that got to have the dirt, and that's really what it is, the, the circle that keeps around the toilet bowl, the group, the, the thing is if you, don't, if you don't like their response that the school district says, that we put it over to the police, and the police did go to the police station, and at that's that's where that's where your problem is. Stop with this madness of wanting to know who the kid is, because that's a lot of what that conversation yeah, of stuff was is throwing out names and stuff like that. That's ridiculous. So people got to respect the fact that we are giving out the information that we need to give and you make the right decision of what you did about having school the next day all of that stuff so the, the coming back around I guess I don't understand coming back around when you got you got two pieces of information if you want dirt and you want more stuff then go go to the police but stop this incessant going after Richmond schools and the ridiculous stuff in that cesspool group that keeps putting out there I didn't read any of that. I mean, and I'm not saying, yeah, I'm, no, talking I'm, about, not I'm, I'm talking about, I'm talking, well, but to me, it's, I mean, it's, it's really a, the same thing. I genuinely concerned parent, I mean, I, I fully trust, obviously. And, I mean, we get the same letters that you're sending out to the parents. Right. The board doesn't get anything any different than you're sending out. And I don't know, do the teachers get anything different? Because um, they'll be hit with all those parents coming in the next morning, too, asking. Maybe the teachers also, I mean, it's just, it's general staff I, I, I will say this in, in the broadest sense when we talk about a school issue, regardless of what the issue is, that letter that goes out to parents, all staff get that. Right. The board gets it. The board doesn't get all the details because if the re incident results in a discipline, so you have to go to that hearing yeah, I do with not a fair, want to fair that. and, right. and right. now, okay. I have, a, you know, from that angle, I, you know, that's part of why the board doesn't have all the facts because it could result in that. The other piece that, that I, I just need to say it, if, if there's a, a student, students, a parent, 
that we've had parent. We will take the photo of that person and share it with the staff that need to know it. Say, hey, be on the car because, you know, you know if, if it's a fourth grader coming to the middle school, they don't know those kids. The other staff in the building don't know that kid yet. The ninth grader coming to the high school, they don't know the, that, that kid yet because they've only had the, the student a couple weeks or a kindergarten yeah. who makes it. I mean, so it's, we, we strategically, for those that need to know, we'll share more information with those because they have to have that information. Our building security monitors are another one. If, they, if there's something that they absolutely need, we'll share with them. And again, that comes back to the whole trusting. I mean, I fully expect that that's what's happening. Yeah. And I would think as a parent, you should fully expect that's what's happening. And if you don't have the trust or whatever the, the thing that you're talking about, then rather than blast all over social media, pick up the phone and contact the superintendent's office and ask your question. And I also get that. Yeah, and that's a, a reason why I appreciate it. I did appreciate okay. you didn't say, yes. like, nobody was going to be held, you know, um, in a negative light if you didn't if you didn't feel comfortable coming to school the next day. Like, as a parent, you know, that's your right. choice, you know. Absolutely. Um, and, and they shouldn't have been, but, um, so, I mean, I feel like, yeah, I don't know, I, I feel like I had You're all that right. information I, mean, I needed. Yeah. Something in my gut saying not to do it, so I'm not going to sign up. Yeah. If that's how they feel. Right. Anybody but in this instance, we did follow up. You you initially asked about I did not being a follow up. I meant like no. with the with the police department. Once it gets into their hands, some I know they have their own page. We received this. Da 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 da. Just it's just kind of like that but combination again, that's all working. But again, go to the police department and ask them what they did about. Not, not, it's not our job to follow up when we turn something over to the police department to report back. If you're, because the question really is coming once it left here and the police department tried to handle it, what happened? Ask the police department. Well, that's what, that was my point. That was my point. I didn't get to that part, but that's what I was trying to say. That's the full circle of it. Anything else? That's what I was considering doing December. Oh. With everybody's idea of that holiday Christmas present, you might buy new phones and so forth. <laughs> this was my thought, and it's, I, it's, I haven't planned it out, was to have find a group of high school kids who are on <laughs> these social media, have a conversation with parents like, what, do, what is Snapchat? What is Whatever the other ones are, because I am the least likely person you want to educate parents on social media. So I, I, I haven't finalized it all yet. I haven't picked the people. Maybe it's a great project that I could work with our student rep to see about it, just to educate. I know Mrs. Ferrante would love to run um, sessions for some of our seniors in our community and just how to use their phones and not be privy to scams that come through the email system or text messages. So that's what I'm. In possibly envisioning for a December one. I don't know how much it would be received because of the holiday with all the things going on, but that has been a conversation I've been, um, because I started thinking on it from just the AI world, just all understanding what AI can do, and all the apps, there's so much that most people have no clue on what the capability out there. Maybe our, our students do. Well, that's, that's funny you say that, like, put it into perspective, because I remember when we were in elementary school, you know, you'd go through that, like, standard cybersecurity protocol in, like, your technology class, and it feels like some of that stuff is, like, totally absolutely. like doubled in risk factors right. and, like, yeah. complexity, and it's, it, it can be scary. I, I could only imagine for people who've never seen it before, and yet it's, like, definitely needs to be approached now in a different way as it's like sort of evolved 
over time to be not only different but like more dangerous in a way. And it, you know, it, it's our job when it, uh, um, to kind of educate those who are now new to it on the best ways to use it, not only to kind of like help uh, use it in the right way, but to protect it from harming you in any way. So I will follow up to that was one that we were going with that. No. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sandy. So I just uh, one thing I did have on my list here, um, <clears throat> I, but I'm going to be real quick because Brian kind of already talked about it. Um, we went to that question and answer form at the ISD for the state board members, and just encourage everybody to do their research. I did take notes and I did type them out. If anybody wants my notes, you're welcome to them. Um, but um, just just really do your research and um, make sure you know who you're voting for and not just the letter at the end of the name, I guess, you know, just make sure that you're doing your research. Anything else? Sandy, your time? I'm all set, yes, okay. sorry. Oh, Margaret? Uh, just, I know we talked about it and then you went on vacation, but just a <laughs> reminder of the, about the email that you're gonna send out about the presentations at the board meetings. Asking staff if they want to come through. Oh, topics. yes. That's the one. You're Is that right. what we're talking about? Yeah. Yes. Yep. I probably have that in my uh, my notes. I don't think I know I need to do. Um, okay. Anything else, Margaret? No, nope, that's it. Okay. I just want to. Um, I have two things on my list. I first want to thank Margaret for taking over my. I was gone and enjoying myself a lot nicer area of the country. We had a good time. It was a good family get together. Um, I also want to mention that next uh, week, um, Sandy, Pandas, and I are going to be going to the MSB Leadership Conference in Lansing. Um, for the first time, for me at least, I'm going to be participating in the delegate meeting, which is on Thursday night. Um, we received a packet um, to take a look at about what's involved and what's going on. Um, I read through it a couple times already. Um, I didn't know if the board wanted any input on it. We, I will, we will actually be voting on issues, but most of what I've read through we're either doing as a district or we're involved or there's there's really nothing new. They have three sections. One section um, will just, uh, we vote on old policies that were put in place last year and if there were any anything they want to do with them. The second part, we vote on any changes to any um, policies to the actual uh, board. And then the third section is if there was anything new and there wasn't, uh, I'm sorry, there were two new items. And then the fourth section is if they want to get rid of anything and there was something they wanted to get rid of. Um, I can send those materials to you if you're interested in looking at that and want to have any input or discussion or anything or give me a call. If you're interested, please just let me know. Um, it was pretty cool. It's pretty neat. I'm looking forward to it. It's something I've never done, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. So I just wanted to share that with you. Can I comment? Sure. Okay. Uh, Deb and I talked yesterday about this, so I'm just going to throw my thing out there with respect to um, board members going to the conference, being a delegate, and voting on things um, on behalf of the board. I have a concern that. The rest of the board, we don't know what all the things are, we, and we didn't we didn't appoint somebody to go and represent the focus. And I know I asked Deb, well, in our many items that we talked yesterday, but Cynthia had signed, and I think Candace has signed up for it as well. Is that correct? So it's both of you in mind? Yes, you are sure. according okay. to Deb. Um, yeah, so two of us are. Yeah. yeah. Signed in, okay. And see, this is yeah. This is Thursday. Oh, okay. This, no, no, no. But this but is. I see what you're saying. This is exactly where I'm coming from. That we're we're going to go in 
and we're going to go for things when the rest of the board doesn't know what you're voting on and you're voting on you're being a delegate on behalf of the board. I would just rather have seen that if that is something those that were going to the conference were going to do, we should have talked about it when we voted on letting everybody go to the conference and paying for it and everything. I think it's important. That delegate thing, in my mind, is really important. And I just have a great concern of them going and voting. And, it's, and Deb and I talked, and it's, it's, it's not a personal, it has nothing to do with, it has to do with the whole process of it. I just have a problem. No one else does, off they go and vote. But um, just even, hold on, hold on, even, yes, there's, yeah, there's every, a every, year. every year, the very first night on Thursday night, yeah. every year. But even even for Deb too, she looked at the stuff yesterday and her, her brief stuff to us, sent it to us to talk, but if we, if we don't, if we don't all agree I believe the majority of the board should say that we're sending delegates to vote for stuff. If I'm over the top, well, you know, everyone else is sitting here at the table. But I think it should be decided by the board that we are solid sending delegates to cast votes on behalf of Richmond School. Well, when we cast votes on behalf of Richmond School in any other way, we usually have to talk about it right at the table and make a decision, and then we send somebody to go and vote as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a consensus. Yeah. So do we have the information as to what we're voting, what on? We're voting on? That's what I just asked. If you yeah, no, that's what I, I thought, thought that you said. We received a packet. Um, like I say, I've been through it twice now. Um, and really, from my opinion, and I will gladly send it out to whoever wants to see it, yeah. we're doing pretty much everything that they're mentioning or bringing about. Okay. Probably one of the biggest pieces that I saw in going through it is they are really pushing boards to get educated, mm -hmm. to get involved in their the classes, uh, to, to do that. That's mm -hmm. a big piece. There's a piece on there about um, suicide prevention because suicide's uh, the biggest in uh, this age, the age group of school kids. So what are you doing as a district? And I know that we've been doing things already for that. Um, so most of the stuff that I read through, or at least again, my opinion, um, we're either doing it or being a part of it. Because what I was going to originally do tonight mm -hmm. was if there was something in there that I thought, oh, we are, as a board, sitting with you. I've sat with you now, or most of you, for two or three years. Um, if I felt it was something we were not doing or not wanting to be involved, I was going to bring it tonight. Mm -hmm. and put it out there for all of us to talk about. So okay. how many things are you voting at? Oh. Would you like to I have it. <laughs> and quite a bit. But, so I have Just, a question though, which one. Did, did it mean in the beginning of the year, when we voted for the positions, there was an ISD rep, there was an MASB rep, Is, wouldn't that be a, that person's title to then be, when that yeah. kind of fall on, on that, yeah, but wouldn't we have to talk about it as a board as what we would vote? Yes, yeah. Yeah, there's a representative that we send to the MASB. And, yeah. Um, but, but the difference, you are right, but the difference when it comes to the conference is that if our whole board went to that conference, all seven of us could go right. and be yeah. delegates. And I don't think voting. so. Yeah. The, I, and anybody could sign I was reading through that, and so. I thought you could only have so many. But I, I could be wrong. I'd have to go back and look. I thought that was in part of the packet here that I read. Um, just some ideas on some of the topics yeah. that we're voting on. Uh, goals and objectives. Okay. Does your district have them? Continuous school improvement. Are we doing school improvement? Just yes. are you doing school improvement, yes or no? Yeah. So it's not really a vote. It's, that's more no, like a survey. No, they're just saying they're, these were uh, general resolutions that they got put in place last year and want to make sure that we are continuing to support that as a district. So then that's not a vote, it's a survey. Well, I, they call it a vote. That's, that's exactly what they're calling it. Isn't there, it's a vote. And it's bylaws. You, so you said, said you Yeah, said there's bylaws. another section on bylaws. The first part is all strictly school stuff. Um, 
at election participation, do we elect our officers? You know, I mean, or do we just whatever? Um, let's see, what else? Is but you know, again, that's not a vote. That's just what we're doing, like it's surveying what we do. No, it's, it's voting on continuing to do to that do process. process. I, don't, I don't believe it's a question of do we do that. Isn't no. It, is, it's a vote on sure. continuing to do that. To do okay. those yes. Yes. yes, that is, not, that is oh, what it is. It's not a okay. survey. Can, um, can I just yeah, go ahead. Think really quick? So this is the, the Michigan Association of School Boards. Correct. It is their state conference. Correct. Correct. Okay. And so by having representatives from local boards go to this and do this voting, it is not mandating school districts and boards no. to do anything. No. It is simply, this is what the Michigan Association of School Boards recommends for right. local boards to do. Am correct. I correct that that's that is correct. the mission of this vote? And it is an organization that does have bylaws, a constitution of bylaws, and so they have to have their members vote on any changes. And so that's what this voting is about as yes. well? Yes, yes, because this, okay, so is this that, is that right? Part. Yep. Do I have that all right? You have it right. Yes, because it, it says right here, as a delegate, delegate selected by your school board, you have an essential voice in shaping our association's resolutions. Okay. Resolutions are the driving force behind the various positions taken by MASB. Okay, so I, I just wanted to clarify that so that okay. people who were watching or listening didn't get confused that it was anything outside of that organization, right? That, right. that it's the right. work of right. this organization, right. it isn't the right. Michigan Department of Education, right. Right. or right. anything right. like that, right. right? It's the Michigan Association of School Boards that that's right. just this is just a piece of doing their work correctly, yeah. right? Um, I I think it would be best just for us to be able to all take a look at that. I can give send it some up. assistance and direction for those um, representatives that are going to be attending and Even placing any kind of And I did watch this. Yeah. Is it yeah. is it proper to just have us? Oh, wait, hold on. Okay. Is Sorry. it proper to just have us? You know, the devil email or whatever she's going to do. And is it proper to each one of us separately to say yes, no, or whatever? You know what I'm saying? Or is it something, is it proper that it should yeah, happen probably. at a meeting? I think probably, because like, like for instance, if, if my memory serves me, like the Macomb ISD budget. You know, I remember the person yeah. who, I was the person who went yeah. to the meeting, yeah. heard all the stuff about the budget, brought it back to the board, we had a conversation about it, and then there was a, yes, please go on behalf of Richmond, go and vote yes on that, Correct. right? And so there was a conversation at the board table about it. It seems like this might might work, need to work the same way. Um, well, we can go and that. sit in on it right. for this year. I mean, so I don't know if we have to vote or not vote or, or whatever. I've never sat in on one. And then maybe next year, we, if we have anybody going, we do that step. I really would like to, I personally would really like to sit in on it because I would like to you see, see sure. what, sure. what how it works, what it's all about. Yeah. I would, I would yeah. have no concerns with going in, sitting on it, watching how it goes. Yeah. And then we'd be able for next year to do but I guess I would just want to know, are you obligated when you go inside the room to, to vote? It, it's like a... I How could they hear me? I know. But I'm saying it's but like a... a it's like a... Uh, I told that it's like a DMC or a Republican thing. It's, it's, no, it's just, it's like a convention. It's a, it's a convention and, and you know. it's just, it's that kind of thing. So I... I don't know. I don't know. So yeah, if, I don't know either. If, if you, if, Going there means you have to cast vote. I have no concern. Right. If going there and watching it happen okay. and coming back and reporting back and then we can move forward for next year, I'm good with that. I would just be well. I don't believe they can force us to vote. Yes, yeah, so I don't think they can. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> no, I believe. No, I mean I can. We can every time. We can do what? We can. What is that? We can abstain. What you're getting into. So to say, to say they can't make you vote, you really can't say that. Because well, I, I know that, but yeah. you can abstain from every time a, something comes up. <laughs> can you find that out, whether you have to vote or not, before going? I, what? I don't, I don't. Yeah, I'll find out. 
All right. C Cynthia helped us put this together, so I will call and I will find out if we have to go. And if we don't, I, I like I say, I still would like to attend. I'd like to be a part of that. you're going to attend to observe. To observe yeah. and bring that back to I, us. I, that's I, great. Yeah, that's I, awesome. I agree with Margaret because, like Candace read that description to um, Tracy, and the very first, out of the first five words was appointed by the board to go there, and yeah. that's not how it happened. It was, right. I liked it myself or signed myself up to go and do it. I don't think right. so. Well, that's not true. Are you going to be there first thing, too? Oh, yeah, that's right. So that might be something we add to next year, too, if we want to do that. And, and then, right, there's yeah. MISD next year. MISD, our original homecoming, and there's MASD last year. So it's not, it's not the same. Okay. I will, I will get some information, and I will send an email out. I will have... Uh, Cynthia send the document to everybody so that you can great. see what's involved. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, next, next item on our agenda is public comments. Since the last board meeting, the board has not received any emails and there are no public comments that need addressing from the last meeting. At this time, any member of the public may address the board. Please sign in and state your name. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Are there any public comments? Okay, being no public comments, we're moving on to our action items. Um, we're going to start off with the approval of a Sunbelt Client Service Agreement, and Mr. Wamsley has asked to speak first. You have to do a motion first before you can speak on the subject. I don't think so, and I'm going to say this. When we, when we, we were originally doing this, where Brian started off with just like an intro, and then I asked for a motion, we were doing that about a year ago, and then we kind of got away from it again. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay with him starting off and then I'll, I'll ask for a motion. You're just giving background, right? Yeah, the conduct in, in the background of the, of the paper is, or the, the board document is, I have Jamie here because he's been kind of spearing this. Uh, we currently have a vacant position. This would be contracting the services for that vacant position. Um, and so there's some information in here that we don't have yet a signed TA or LOA with the REA, the Teachers Union, but conceptually we've agreed on they're allowing this. So our plan is to move forward without the LOA because we have a position that's vacant and we want someone in, in person. We don't want to do virtual services. And so that's kind of the context of it. So Jamie's been working with uh, the REA to try to get a LOA put together. So you have all that document in the back of it. Um, normally this would probably been a presentation and then next week the next board meeting an action item, but we gotta get this approved to get get a person. So that's okay. okay. I'm looking for a motion please. A motion to accept the recommendation of the superintendent to approve the contract with Sunbelt Staffing LLC in the efforts to staff vacant special education teacher positions. The cost of the third party teacher will vary depending on the experience, certifications, and the timing of the contract. Thank you. Any discussion? I so, go ahead. I have questions. Okay, so if we're doing this motion and when it's approved, we're going to start, but we don't have a letter of agreement. So, what, what, happens, what, what happens if the letter of agreement never happens? Are we Is this still a thing? What happens to this motion? What happens to this decision? So based on the based on the letter of the contract, um, without a LOA, a grievance could be filed. Okay. But I don't believe. But I don't believe. What did you say? Not too far off. In, in essence, the agreement is. We know we have a vacancy. We can't find people with special ed certification. A lot of people in the special ed world or, or industry are going to third party because they are the retire, rehire. They can they can make this money. Uh, so 
the, the agreement is that we will keep it posted as soon as we find someone that we can physically hire and become a Richmond employee, we will terminate the contract and hire that. But there's a termination clause that I believe it's 60 days that we have to file. So there could be some overlap. But if, you know, if I find someone and I offer the position, they might have to give notice to their employees, so there might not be as much, but there's there's some um, their length. But I guess on a worst case, yeah, there could be agreements filed because the contract prohibits us from contracting teachers unless we to agree upon. But again, as the conversation, I sent an email to the REA president last week, I think it was, that basically said, we don't have it yet. I'm optimistic we're going to get it. Here's what we agreed upon when we met and talked. And she responded back saying, Basically, yeah, that's what we agreed upon. We just got to finalize the wordsmithing of the document. So, um, would they file agreements? Probably not, because conceptually, okay. we're on the same page. It's okay. just the wordsmithing. So. Yeah, that was my same question because I don't want to vote yes on something that like there's repercussions to. I, I would I'm be I would be shocked yeah. because the concept. We both were in agreement. We don't want to privatize teaching. That's not what we're in for. But in this day and age where certain contact areas are hard to find, special ed being one of them, we can hire a third party. And again, it's just a for this year only. It expires at the end of the year, goes away, and we start this process all over again. Yeah, because so. I don't want to deny any special ed student services or make a current special ed teacher have to do additional services because of the shortage and then it makes their the student services not as good of a service uh, they're still getting they may still be getting their 25 or 35 or 45 minutes with somebody but it's not as good a service as it could have been if we have this additional so so nobody's not being serviced Whereas is our caseloads are nearing max, right, right? And that that just right. Challenging. So it puts stress and puts a yes. it puts so a stress on the quality it. of the service that's provided. And we so had the student. position prior to the school year starting, right before school, not having someone. We shifted schedules to make sure everybody was covered. All kids had a, a provider, et cetera, and got the services. But we're tight, and if you get new kids in, it becomes harder to manage when we don't have the body. Right. So that's what we're. So then how long does this stay open-ended? Like, what if we don't do it? Like, what if we don't fill a position? Like, this motion just stays open until the end of the year or forever? Or? This is just through the end of the year. This is all we're looking for, because the LOA would that. just be, we, we both agree okay. that it's just through this school year. Okay. If this happens again, we gotta come back and do it. Um, the process on this one is once we, we've already interviewed some of their candidates, and okay. we didn't like, the candidate wasn't a fit, so they're tr still trying to find us candidates. So just because it's signed, doesn't even doesn't mean we're going to have someone tomorrow. That's what, that was my There's question. a process. Do we have somebody in line, and it's like we're just waiting for us to say yes. And, and they they'll it? send us candidates, but they don't have a big pool either that they're drawing from. Sure. I guess that's fair to say. So, so can I just ask? So why Sunbelt? Are there other companies that do this work, or? Yeah, there are, but this one, they had one on standby for some interviews with them. Now they, they said they have a few more, so we're just waiting to get their resumes and stuff. There, there's no, none of us have experience with Sunbelt or any of the yeah. other ones specifically. Okay. The one time we did do this contract services, and I don't remember how many years ago, but it was a virtual speech that we contracted. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't want a virtual teacher. We want an in-person sure. teacher providing it. And sure. so we, we can have a virtual teacher like that tomorrow, <laughs> but that, that's a, it's, it's challenging. It's not, it's not a first not so, do you, so do you know other districts that have used some of them at all? Or there, um, I don't have off the top of my, my head, but there are, there's districts that have utilized this. I know East Point has contracted services, and I believe um, what was the Amy was familiar with them. Yeah, Amy, our special ed director, she was familiar and has used them personally in her previous career. Got it. Job. <coughs> right. 
all I have not had any experience with any of the companies that that, right. that are out there. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we have a second uh, action item, Mr. Wellesley. The only reason why I asked to speak on this one is because though the contract is November 1 through, it's a two-year contract through October 31st of 26, if something happens between now and November 1, we get a snowfall, plowing, the company's willing to work with us now and provide that service. So we're not out of luck. We don't have anybody not servicing. So this is for landscaping and snow removal. So we don't have to worry about getting our shovels out? And in years past, we've had, a, we've had an October snow. Right. <laughs> okay, I'm looking for a motion for the approval of snow plowing, removal, and salting, lawn mowing, and athletic field painting services contract. Can I ask a question? In, in discussion. Okay. I move to accept the recommendation of the superintendent and approve the snow plowing slash removal and salting, lawn mowing, and athletic field painting services contract with Ultimate Lawn Service Inc. from November 1st, 2024 through October 31st, 2026 at rates listed for each of the services categories of the bid documentation. The board authorizes the superintendent to extend the services contract by an additional year. Um, do I have support? Support. Thank you. Any discussion? Candace? Yes. How does this um Um, they are higher than values. Um, at some point, I think it put it in the background, and Jamie put it in, they opted not to, and I think it, a lot of it has to do with staffing. Um, this is probably more in ballpark with landscaping and snow removal services. We've been pretty lucky in the last couple of years that we've had low bids, whether with dahlias, we had Stafford's in there for a little bit, and then it came back to dahlias, so. Um, It, it is. It is this, higher. This is not the same company for that reason? No, Dahlia's opted to end their contract. Okay. Um, I just remember having it come to you multiple times. Yeah. They've yeah. done a great job for us and so yeah. forth, but sometimes when they're out here cutting on the weekends, or on the, you only see two people. They just have not had the number of people, and it's just the nature of the industry, finding reliable people. Um, and I think it's cutting into other parts where you just said that you just stop this and focus more on these other industries. Any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we have a motion and a second. 